Thank you. So we've heard um, our panelists. And now we are opening for questions. We would need to finish in 20 minutes sharp uh, because there are other events that are taking place and some of us would need to go and attend those events. And just as, a, um, by, as information, actually, when it comes to people with disabilities, Australia adopted a non-discrimination law in 92, Canada, 86, New Zealand, 93, United States with ADA in 1990, and South Africa and Brazil um, and Ghana have anti-discrimination clauses included in their constitution. Uh, there's also some evidence of what works and what it doesn't, what doesn't when it comes to the implementation of anti-discrimination laws. But again, I am promoting the book. You can have a look at this report. Um, now we are opening for questions. Three questions to start with. Rasmus. So thanks for three wonderful and, and interesting uh, presentations. I guess my what I'm wondering is is a little bit the. The, what is the strategy for change and the role for the World Bank implied by your three presentations? Uh, the, the first one, what I take with me very much is the role of social mobilization, enabled by the right to representation. And from the last presentation, what I very much take with me is sort of the need for legal reform and, and, and perhaps a little bit excessive optimism about what you can accomplish by legal reform and impl implementation via the public sector. And but, but I think Maitri also reminds us that there's a third um, um, uh, driver of change, which are mindsets, and mindsets do change, culture change, in ways we, don't, we often don't understand very well. And, and, and sort of, so putting these three aspects together, the social mobilization, legal reform, and just mindsets of people that change over time, I, I think we need to think a little bit about how those three areas play together, how they can and, and, uh, mutually reinforce one another, and how strategically agencies such as the World Bank can, can promote these, these processes. Thank you, Rasmus. Dina? So first, I, I just wanted to thank all the three panelists for coming. To me, this was super exciting because I was um, uh, on the um, other side of these papers over the last year. All these authors wrote these wonderful papers, which we drew on substantially for the World Development Report. And as I was reading them, I, I sort of had this fantasy that someday we'd get you all together so, to have a, um, a live conversation because I think these presentations really speak to each other really well. I mean, we have the sort of broad um, discussion of um, the social and economic context of discrimination related to inclusion and ex exclusion um, from Maitre, the um, legal perspective um, from Sandy, and then from Marty, how in the real world groups that we wouldn't anticipate would be able to access legal mechanisms really can when, as, as um, uh, we just heard, uh, supplemented with um, some tools for voice and, and access to collective action. So really uh, thanks uh, all of you and thanks to the Nordic Trust Fund for making this um, uh, possible. Um, so just two questions. One is um, on terminology, um, and, and I think this is mainly for my trade, but, but maybe others have views. You use the term exclusion, and you're writing an inclusion report. Um, but the, how do you think about the distinction between exclusion and discrimination? Um, so when I was working in the ECHA region on the Roma issue, um, we found it um, politically unacceptable to talk about discrimination because that stepped into the world of um, legal uh, um, t terrain, and so it was much safer to talk about exclusion, which you know didn't necessarily point a finger to any particular party. So I'm wondering um, how uh, we should be using those terms and how you think about them. Um, and then, uh, you know, maybe a, a related uh, uh, question on, you know, where we in the World Bank can take this forward. I mean, I think all of you pointed to the, um, uh, you know, where legal remedies can make a difference, but also that there's some limits. And how can we think about those limits in policy terms, um, you know, and where we can come in from an operational perspective? So thanks again. Thanks, Dina. Excellent question. I also wanted to add to the terminology, the, uh, it seems to me that deprivation uh, is often used as a synonym with, uh, or discrimination 
is used as a synonym with deprivation and uh, where one ends and the other starts, it's really a question because it seems that um, from the presentation, all issues related social, uh, to social and economic status of various groups of the population from poverty to outright abuse of uh, domestic workers are included as discrimination. And I think that's for operational purpose that needs to be more uh, uh, unbundled. Uh, please go ahead. We'll have, okay, we have two more candidates and then this, that is for the questions and then we go uh, with answers. Please, can uh, thank you please you introduce much. yourself? I, I go back with inspiration on big ideas, good tools, techniques for the operation work. So thanks, Tan. But there is one puzzle that remains and I want to hear from the panelists and what they think. The two biggest forms of discrimination are informality and women's participation in the labor force. We know Martha talked about informality being exceptionally persistent. It hasn't really shrunk. It has remained large. But when we open up the informal sector and take out men, it actually shrinks. So a large proportion of women are joining the informal sector. So the combination of women's participation in the informality and the informality with its own discrimination has become a big paradox. Why might this be happening? All right, so two more and then we wrap up. Uh, thanks, three great presentations. I'm Anders Zeilum from the Nordic Trust Fund. And um, my, my question is, in all these three areas that you talked about, is it possible to say, to generalize and say something about how countries change as they become richer? So in the case of uh, informality, for example, is, does the size and the composition of the informal sector change in a country as it becomes richer? Or if you compare rich and poor countries, what's the difference? Similarly, in discrimination, is, uh, as a country becomes richer, do we all become more reasonable and get along better and discriminate less? <laughs> and um, the laws also, do they, do they change over time? I would imagine of particular interest would be comparing countries that once were very similar, but then one has done well economically and one has not. When I heard Sandra's presentation, I saw you had looked at Botswana and Zambia, and they are often held up as a pair, you know, that came from, um, they were British colonies, they're both resource rich, and Zambia has, an, has uh, not done well economically, but Botswana has. So, any thoughts in, uh, around that? Thank you. And finally, one more. Thank you very much. My name is Hans Otosano. I'm from the Nordic Trust Fund as well. Um, so what we have seen when we have been looking at uh, World Bank reports and uh, the way in which concepts are used in the World Bank, the, the, the concept of uh, discrimination is not a concept that the World Bank is very comfortable with. Maybe in isolated cases when uh, it uh, focuses on discrimination against women, it's possible that uh, the, the, the usual words of equity or equality uh, are not resorted to, but a discrimination as a legal uh, concept. But in many other aspects and many other analysis, we don't find a lot of attention to uh, discrimination as a legal concept. Um, then now uh, we are hearing a lot about extreme poverty, uh, and it's uh, going to be uh, a new uh, part of the new strategy. So my question is, uh, based on your empirical uh, uh, studies, how important will uh, policies of uh, non-discrimination, legal policies of non-discrimination be in attacking uh, extreme poverty. Thank you. Okay, so we try to answer your questions uh, in a bundle very quickly. So we start with Marty. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you for the good questions, and I won't be able to <laughs> address all. In terms of strategy for change, um, what I would say in addition to the social mobilization, um, you do need information and data. You need to make all of this explicit, uh, whether it's discrimination because of informality or other forms. Um, so we believe very much on data, on research, in addition to the social mobilization. Um, you also have to reframe how people think. You have to come up with some alternative ways of thinking that the informal is normal or whatever in order to change the mindsets. And then you get to the legal reforms or the other kinds of reforms. Now, in terms of the role of the World Bank, uh, who am I as an outsider to say, but I did have a quick meeting um, just before this session with people in the urban development section of the South Asia region. Now, all these groups, um, the practices and policies and regulations of cities are totally threatening at this point to all these groups that I'm, well, less so the domestic workers, but certainly street vendors. And so I think we have to say that it's not just law, <laughs> but it's also economic policies. And so long as the informal is seen completely as illegal or avoiding regulations, rather than saying that's part of the informal, but the bulk of the informal are working poor trying to earn an honest living. The, all of the, the policies are biased as well. It's not just laws. And so we have to move into the policy realm. And if you take a constitutional court judgment like in Bogota, that has to be then made into a policy and a scheme by the city. So, and that the World Bank is completely in that world of economic policy. And so I think we have to, um, there is a big role um, for the World Bank. Um, I'll just answer one other, um, the extreme poverty question and, um, and the new strategy. For those of us who work on poverty, and I work in South Asia, which has a lot of poverty, the fact that employment and jobs has only now been put on the agenda as helping to reduce poverty is, is like missing the nose on your face as far as we're concerned. The first MDGs had no target on employment at all, right? So I'm really happy that employment is on the agenda. But the only way for the poor to come out of poverty, they, what they have is what they earn, whether it's remittances or the direct earnings. And so jobs are absolutely central, right? And so long as we're not creating enough formal jobs, we have to not undermine the informal jobs. And the trouble is in cities around the world, they're deindustrializing, so we're not creating jobs. And the cities are completely undermining the livelihoods. A city I know very well in, in India, Ahmedabad, 100,000 vendors. If the city goes through with all of the schemes it has, whether it's riverside development, model roads, heritage sites, bus rapid transfer, at least one third of those vendors have lost their jobs. And they're not, so it's at the heart of the matter is to look at, at these workers and what they do and try to support them in some way, which requires a different mindset. That not all cities need to look like Shanghai, thank you very much, or Singapore, but we should have the informal next to the formal. We've got to have it. Otherwise, we have a catastrophe. Thank you. Uh -huh. Um So quickly, I, I'm, I think what I'm going to do is to sort of put uh, Hans Otto and, and Rasmus's is questions together. And it's a little bit about, OK, so what does this mean for the bank? And um, you know, and we often get asked that, oh, interesting, but what does this mean for the bank? Um, and, and what we are arguing in the social inclusion report is this actually means a lot for the bank. and. Uh, the way we, we think about it is that, you know, that there are four areas in which the bank can actually influence this. So there are four steps in which the bank can actually influence the operational agenda. And we go right, we go to the to the project level first. And and so there are four four ways in which the first first way is 
We say, okay, you know, don't just accept that certain people are overrepresented among the poor. Don't just accept that certain people are ov overrepresented in certain occupation. Ask why, and which means that the kind of analysis that you do um, actually really matters, and the kinds of methods you use to actually get at your. So, if you if you really ask why, say, indigenous people are overrepresented among the poor, um, then you know you could get all kinds of answers like, oh, they live very far away. So, well, why do they live very far away? Um, because they um, live in their own habitation. I mean, this can go on and on and on. Ultimately, you can actually get at issues that are sort of very critical to the lives of indigenous people, which is lands and land and forests. Now, you're trying, let's say you're trying to intervene in maternal mortality. And you say, well, indigenous people have very high maternal mortality, so we're going to build more hospitals, because that's really the problem. Well, as it turns out, you may be completely missing the point there. And hospitals is not what you need at all. And you may be hitting the issue of a maternal mortality with a very blunt instrument if you are only building more hospitals and there's there's you're just going with a supply side fix to it so um, i think asking why and getting at the real real issues of discrimination are is is very central and then affects the design so then we actually go into into discussing well, you know what are alternative design options and as as marty was saying you know there could be alternative des design options say in urban zoning policies or in um, you know in slum upgradation there could be alternative design options and then there are alternative monitoring options so the chances are that the places that you're talking about or even or discrimination, you have no data. You don't have a baseline. You don't know what to start with. So if you're going to start with very typically a baseline of zero in your in your results um, matrix, um, well, there's only there's nowhere to go but up. But but in fact, if you're going to look at monitoring much more creatively in terms of you know monitoring real time monitoring, monitoring through cell phones, monitoring through perception surveys, third party monitoring, there are different ways of doing monitoring monitoring that can get you real information, real time. And finally, you know, what do you do with all this grievance that is accumulating? So what do you do when you realize that your monitoring framework is showing that you're, you're actually not doing so well? What do you do then? So there are, there are sort of four stages in which you could actually potentially influence. And the other level at which you can influence is much more at a policy level. So whether it's you know, through CPSs or through policy discussions, um, I think many of our policies are exactly as, as Hans Otto says, they're discrimination blind. So, um, you know, you're actually talking about something else when you really mean discrimination, but you're not saying discrimination because it's not kosher to say discrimination. And, you know, in, in our work, we actually find that, you know, it's all right to say it because the whole world is saying it. And um, it's, I think it's only in certain kinds of documents or with reference to certain countries when you're being too explicit, you have a, you have a problem. But I don't think there's necessarily to shy away from, from some of that. But I'm not going to answer the more difficult question that Dina raised, which is the, the issue of exclusion and discrimination although we do have uh, we do have ideas about you know uh, you know something being a process and something being an outcome and discrimination falls a lot in the idea of process and uh, in terms of practice whereas inequality falls very much in the idea of an uh, of an outcome exclusion falls somewhere in the middle in that it can be a both outcome as well as a process so um, that's that's the way we try and separate it out um, it's I think much easier to say deprivation uh, to separate out discrimination and de deprivation and we give the example of a of a gay man who is actually a rich gay man who is living in a rich neighborhood so poverty doesn't affect him inequality doesn't affect him but discrimination affects him so um, he's not deprived in terms of material deprivation, but he may well be deprived in terms of other forms of um, deprivation. So I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you, Metri Sandy, and not answer Ijaz's question, which I'm going to leave to Sandy because um, I don't have an answer. Well, thank you for some really fascinating questions, and many of them have, have been dealt with. Um, the, the first question is how legal reform mindsets and search for mobilisation fit together and you talked about excessive optimism about legal reform and I, I think one has to think about legal reform as law is not just about penalizing but also about giving messages and so law also has an expressive function in a country and if you you have de jure discrimination it, um, and if you don't have proper laws about discrimination you're also giving messages about what's okay and what's not okay. So I think legal reform and mindsets work closely together. It might be useless if you don't also influence the mindsets. And that's why, and this also in a way hinges, uh, 
impinges on Dina's point about you don't want to say discrimination because it, it, it seems to infer fault. Um, what we also want to move into is fourth generation legal reform, which is to say that you, you agree that it's about systemic change and you put the initiative on those who can bring about change to actually do so, even though you're not attributing fault, you're just re attributing responsibility because you are in a position to bring about change. So I think, and legal reform works best with social mobilization. They all have to work together. Where we start is difficult to say, but I would just like to add into the picture that many, of, many countries have actually signed up to international conventions. Um, they've signed up to CEDAW and CERD and the ILO conventions, the Disability Rights Convention, and so they do have, they are already international structures which ought to be impelling, that's the start of the change, they ought to be impelling countries to bring about legal change. Um, and we, we have to think about that. On the informal sector, and um, uh, what I'd like to say about the informal sector from the legal perspective is, we need to, I think, disaggregate what we mean by the informal sector because we have, and um, Arthur put it very well about the difference from street traders to domestic workers, but also we have informality developing within the formal sector in the form of precarious work, temporary contracts, agency work and contracting out. And there are different legal strategies for those, which comes up to your point to an extent. We have to be very careful to design laws which don't actually incentivize um, people sidestepping the legal provisions. And if you, if you protect some groups and not others, you may well find some incentive to informalize because some groups are protected and not others. So the law, that's why I stress the law has to be <coughs> comprehensive. If you don't include, if you don't include small employers, if you don't include workers under 12 months employment or under six months employment or workers on temporary contracts, then you find more and more reconfiguring. So the law has to see through that. Uh, and those are situations in which you can reformalize informal work through the, through, the, through the labor laws. But the street traders have to be dealt with differently through social security, environmental laws, public order laws, etc. And that, I think, impinges also on whether we call it discrimination or not. So thank you. So you want to stop. But thank you to our presenters, to Marty, Sandy, and Metri. Thanks to all you, of you for being interested and uh, staying uh, for the entire uh, session. Uh, it's been fascinating, and we learned a lot, I think, and a lot of food for thought how we take this on into our operational work. Thank you. <laughs>